Okay, anticipatory repudiation. Crabbies, we like crabbies. And it starts with Sackett v. Spindler. So here's the timeline of that case so we get a better, um, I'm gonna stop saying that. Fact timeline, pre-October 50, repeated failures on the part of Sackett to make payments. October 5th, Spindler's attorney states there will be no sale and purchase of the stock. On the 6th, Sackett's attorneys propose an alternative method to pay for the stock. October 6th, Spindler's attorney responds that the sale can go through if Sackett pays the balance in case or its equivalent. Question, did Spindler's October 5th communication to Sackett that there will be no sale or purchase of the stock constitute a breach of contract? Answer, no. Sackett's repeated failure to make payment constituted a total as opposed to partial breach. In the instant case, it was extremely uncertain as to whether, in fact, Sackett intended to complete the contract. In addition, in light of Spindler's numerous requests to Sackett for the balance due under the contract, the latter's failure to perform could certainly not be characterized as innocent. Rather, it could be but ascribed to gross negligence or willful conduct on his part. The evidence which the evidence was such as to warrant the inference that he did not intend to perform the subject contract. Certainly the state of the record was such as to justify the conclusion either that it was unlikely that Sackett would tender the balance due or that he would do so at his own convenience. Even if Spindler should not have treated Sackett's breach as total as opposed to merely partial, Spindler's repudiation was anticipatory. Sackett clearly disregarded the repudiation because his attorney still offered to make payment. Moreover, Spindler's attorney retracted the repudiation in October 6th by stating that Spindler would still accept payment. So it could go back and forth. Two forty-one circumstances significant in determining whether failure is material. In determining whether a failure to tender or to offer performance is material, the following circumstances are significant. The extent to which the injured party will be deprived of the benefit, which he reasonably expected. The extent to which the injured party can be adequately compensated for the part of that benefit of which he will be deprived the extent of which the party failing to perform or to offer to perform will suffer forfeiture, the likelihood that party failing to perform or to offer to perform will cure his failure taking account of all the circumstances, including any reasonable assurances, the extent to which the behavior of the party failing to perform or to offer to perform comports with standards of good faith and fair dealing. Statement 242, circumstances significant in determining whether when remaining duties are discharged. In determining the time after which a party's uncured material failure to render or to offer performance discharges the other party's remaining duties to render performance under the rules stated in 237 and 238, the following circumstances are significant. Those stated above. And then the extent to which it reasonably appears to the injured party that delay may prevent or hinder him in making reasonable substitute arrangements, the extent to which the agreement provides for performance without delay, but a material failure to perform or to offer to perform on a stated day does not itself discharge the party's remaining duties unless the circumstances, including the language of the agreement, indicate the performance or an offer to perform by that day is important. Material partial material is a partial breach versus total breach effective material breach performance by non breaching party may be suspended until the material breach is cured victim pushes pause effective total breach stop victim exits the contract and looks for other arrangements discharges remaining duties of the non breaching party restatement 240 when a statement or an act is in repudiation or repudiation is it short circuits the total breach process 
a statement by the obligeur to the obligee indicating that the obligeur will commit a breach that would of itself give the obligee a claim for damages for total breach. A voluntary affirmative act which renders the obligeur unable or apparently unable to perform without such a breach. So this is Truman v. Schumpf. Did Truman's letter on May 21st con constitute an anticipatory repudiation? No, the letter was insufficiently clear regarding repudiation. Remember, it needs to be like crystal clear. And then waiver is a voluntary relinquishment of the, of the legal right. So the party that has put on the condition to the other party can say, okay, it doesn't matter. And they can do that through words or they can do it through conduct. Anticipatory repudiation must be definite and unequivocal. Comment B says, nature of a statement. In order to constitute a repudiation, a party's language must be sufficiently positive to be reasonably interpreted to mean that the party will not and cannot or cannot perform. Mere expression of doubt as to his willingness or ability to perform is not enough to constitute a repudiation, although such an expression may give an obligee reasonable grounds to believe that the obligeur will commit a serious breach and may ultimately result in a repudiation under the rule stated in 251. In addition, even if there has been a repudiation, um, it can be retracted. Restatement 246, nullification of repudiation or basis for repudiation. The effect of a statement as constituting a repudiation under 250 or the basis for repudiation under 251 is nullified by a retraction of the statement if notification of the retraction comes to the attention of the injured party before he materially changes his position in reliance on the repudiation or indicates to the other party that he considers the repudiation to be final. The effect of events other than the statement as constituting a repudiation under 250 or the basis for repudiation under 251 is nullified if, to the knowledge of the injured party, those events have ceased to exist before he materially changes his position in reliance on the repudiation or indicates to the other party that he considers. So, either a statement or events the only difference between those. In addition, even if there has been a repudiation, it was, in, it was retracted in time. Schumpf did not change its position in reliance on the repudiation. There was no sale or offer. Schumpf did not indicate that he understood the repudiation to be final. So, takeaway, the repudiation is rescinded and the other person doesn't say, uh, hasn't said beforehand that like, I consider this final, then it can be revoked and